this one's on. Hello, welcome to Tuesday Evening at the Modern. I am Tiffany Wolf Smith. I am Assistant Curator of Education here at the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth. And I'm filling in for our beloved Terry Thornton this evening. Um, we miss her, she's sad she's not here, but I'll try to be a good representation of, of her while she's not here. Um, so I am very privileged to introduce our speaker this evening. And up front, I didn't mention it to you, but if any of Lilia's friends are tuning in from the Ukraine, I am very sorry about some of my pronunciation. I'm gonna try to work through it. We'll make sure I don't butcher it too much. Um, so Lilia Kudelia is a curator and art historian, has a beautiful name too, if you noticed. Um, her current research focuses on television and art from the 1960s and onwards and the challenges in the restaging and preservation broadcast dependent and CRT based artworks, which she'll explain more to you. This is all new stuff to me. Um, with an interest in post-communist art infrastructures, Kudelia currently serves as a guest curator at Residency Unlimited in New York, where she develops residencies for laureates of the Young Visual Arts Awards which is a far-reaching network of 12 awards in the countries of Eastern, Central, and Southern Europe. It's a very busy job. Um, she has previously held curatorial and research positions at Dallas Contemporary in Dallas, which is where I first came across her. She put on some really great exhibitions in that space, and at the Corcoran Gallery of Art in Washington, DC, and the Art Arsenal in Kiev, Ukraine. In 2017, Kudelia co-curated the Ukrainian National Pavilion at the Fifth Venice Biennale that featured work by photographer Boris Mikolov. Um, she holds an MFA in Art History from the Institute of Fine Arts at New York University, a BA in Cultural Studies from the National University of Kiev, Mohila, um, Academy in Ukraine and was a visiting scholar at the University of Toronto in Canada. So she is a globe, globe trotting curator. Um, tonight, Kudelia presents Art in the Currents of Television Broadcasting Brazos River from 1976. And she will unearth a little known work in the Modern's permanent collection by the artist Robert Rauschenberg. The Fort Worth Art Museum, as the modern used to be known, commissioned the Brazos River video in 1976 and broadcast it over KERA TV channel 13, which many of you know still exists today. The resulting video was a collaboration between Rauschenberg, Viola Farber Dance Company, and David Tudor. Kudelia notes, and I quote, conceived by the artists and the curator Anne LeVay during the period of privileged access to the TV network environment, the first television exhibition in Texas aimed to amplify the presence of the museum beyond the North Texas region. And despite its short-lived presentation on local television in 1977, the project shines a new light on the question of preservation and restaging of TV-based artworks in the context of contemporary screen-dominated landscape. Um, so I am very anxious to know more about this elusive work that is actually a new revelation to me. Um, so please w join me in welcoming Lilia Kudelia to the stage. Thank you so much, Tiffany, for this nuanced and kind introduction. Um, I would like to start by acknowledging all the people on the museum team who made today's event possible. <clears throat> Terry Thornton for her enthusiastic response to my research and for invitation to present tonight. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you Clancy Manuel, thank you Amy Cardoza, Alison Hurst, and especially Jessica Jernigan for generously providing the access to the materials in the museum collection. Exactly one year ago in October 2020, when I first dived into Brazos River project. I'm incredibly honored to be at this auditorium tonight after spending multiple hours in the Modern's media room where I examined and rewatched the video that is at the focus of my presentation tonight. 
It also feels particularly special to be at this stage after Harmony Holidays presentation that took place uh, here and in the virtual realm last week. Um, Harmony's thoughts on the histories of performance spaces, the importance of the venue as such, and the value of witnessing and revisiting archives made me pondering again about existing and no longer existing infrastructures for documenting the performances and these events' subsequent engagement with mechanisms of memory, like it happened, luckily, in the case of Brazos River. Uh, that said, I'm also grateful to wonderful people involved with the KERA TV station in Dallas, curators and librarians at the SMU Hammond Arts Library and at the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation, and all of those people who agreed to do interviews with me during my research and whom I will quote later um, in the presentation tonight. And thank you so much to all of you who are here in this auditorium tonight and tuning in um, online for um, attending the talk. <clears throat> um, I focused my thinking on the screen back in 2017 when an exhibition by photographer Boris Mikhailov took place at Dallas Contemporary. Uh, Mikhailov's series of large-scale photographs entitled Parliament that we showed at the museum at that time captured glitched, distorted portraits of no longer recognizable personalities that appeared on television at the haphazard moments of weak transmissions or signal disruption. The appearance of these leaking bodies seems so symptomatic of our relationships with the screen, especially over the recent years when the distance between a monitor and a human has condensed to an extent when the screen is really a membrane, to use Juliana Bruno's definition, porous, permeable, and one that holds us permanently dependable on it for, social, for the so much needed social survival. While I'm referencing the screen, you might be thinking first of smartphones and held health devices, but just a few decades ago, that same anxiety was obviously directed at televisions. Media historian Susan Murray wrote that the gravest and most all-encompassing danger from the proximity of human bodies to a screen came in the 50s and 1960s, when health and technology experts argued for the need to manage and regulate the distance between a human body and an electronic screen, particularly in light of the terrifying prospect of color TV-induced radiation sickness. Electromagnetic frequencies as a resource indeed is a somewhat mysterious medium. At the beginning of the 20th century, it, it was a scarce resource. By the end of the century, it becomes a medium of abundance due to hundreds of satellite and cable channels constituting a regular rhythm of the ambient sights and sounds inside the households. Through broadcast transmissions, we ended up in a secondary environment of images that now constitute both nationally authorized cultures and the global infosphere. The early TV technology between 1940s and 70s was a strange mixture of precision engineering, electronics, and photochemistry. It was cumbersome, complicated, and close to small groups of generally prosperous professionals and corporate entities before portable video equipment became available and more cost-effective for artists to obtain. The fuzzy, squarish picture of a four by three ratio inside the miniaturized TV equipment seemed inferior to the better kind of a cinema screen. However, its potential for reconsidering the concept of an audience appealed to many, including artists. Among the art historians, a new discussion emerged relatively recently about the brief disruption inside television network environment between 1968 and mid-70s, which ignited the creative imaginary of artists. One of the reasons for it was the Rockefeller Foundation's somewhat sudden decision to sponsor artists' programming on public television. Uh, between 1967 and 77, the Rockefeller Foundation donated more than 3.4 million to public broadcasting stations to fund experimental artists' workshops in television studios. <clears throat> Latest publications by Chris Paulson and Gloria Sutton, for example, analyze this impressive layer of artists' television, including collaborations between artists and engineers at WGBH TV station in Boston, KQED in San Francisco, WNET in New York, as well as the establishment of a museum television station at Long Beach Museum of Art in California in the 70s, to name a few. 
Uh, widely known is also Howard Weiss's landmark exhibition TV as creative medium that took place in 1969 and the new television workshop established in 1974 in Boston that subsequently traveled to 10 institutions as a package of 15 video works and collateral programming at local venues. So in between East Coast and West Coast in the US, I was curious whether anything was happening in Texas at that period. And I was pleased to come across a wonderful example of such cooperative art. Uh, you're looking at a cover of a folder with uh, what appears to be one of the least known works by Robert Rauschenberg, produced, as Tiffany already mentioned, in collaboration with Viola Farber Dance Company and composers David Tudor and Elvin Lucier, who came to Dallas in December 1976 to create the first television exhibition in Texas. A 60 minutes long video, Brazos River, was commissioned by the Fort Worth Art Museum and produced at PBS affiliated station KRA Channel 13 with the support of the National Endowment for the Arts Grant and in line with extensive celebrations and observances of the United States Bicentennial. Its only public broadcast in the North Texas region took place in February 1977. <clears throat> Under the guidance of Richard Koshalik and Jay Belolli, um, who were directors here at, between 1974 and 78, in an attempt to gain national attention and break into the mainstream, the Fort Worth Art Museum, according to historical reviews and to what some of you probably remember, uh, was running on a high-powered program that placed heavy emphasis on performing arts. When curator Anne Levy had been promoted to director of performing arts in 1976, she brought many choreographers, including Twyla Tharp, Trisha Brown, and Merce Cunningham to Fort Worth and published an impressive monograph, monograph contemporary dance. The museum was also publishing a short-lived performing arts quarterly bulletin, <coughs> first issue of which you see on the screen, and it announces upcoming television project with four artists um, Rauschenberg, Viola Farber, <clears throat> David Tudor, and Lucier pictured at Captiva uh, Island uh, during uh, the modern uh, team's visit to their studio when they discussed this collaboration. <clears throat> the act of transmission across distance comes with an understanding of television as a platform where publicness may be temporarily expanded. Once seen as a public cultural form, television provides a privileged context for contemporary art practices. For the Fort Worth Art Museum, which in mid-1970s positioned itself as the major contemporary museum in the American Southwest, a television exhibition format carried important electric charge um, and the excitement of the shared reception. Um, hence, amplification can be viewed predominantly as a function of scale and an infrastructural necessity within the remote cultural landscape of Texas. Uh, compared to the burgeoning experimental TV programs and residencies for video artists in Boston, New York, and San Francisco that I mentioned earlier, Fort Worth Art Museum's intervention into the local TV channel was singular, although Anne Levy, the curator, attempted to secure broadcasts and disseminate the tape across PBS stations outside of Texas. Brazos Rio was screened at Leo Castelli Gallery in 1978 in New York and was also included in a video screening program curated by Barbara London at MoMA the same year. After Levy's resignation from the museum in 1978, the partnership with Kara TV didn't continue, which wasn't uncommon in other cases as well, um, as uh, many art historians pointed, um, uh, speaking about this project inside television studios at that time, airing the programs was an added bonus rather than a necessary outcome. So it was the emphasis was always on collaboration within the studio, not necessarily screening and broadcasting these works to larger audiences. Um, other than Dallas-Fort Worth area, another significant collaboration in Texas took place at the TV station in Amarillo, where Nancy Holt and Richard Serra's eminent performance, Boomerang, was broadcast live in 1974, just a year after Serra's paradigmatic piece, Television Delivers People, which um, you may be familiar with, <clears throat> sitting in an anchor's chair in front of a blue background for 10 minutes, Nancy Holt talks in this video while the delayed 
uh, echo of her own speech inside the earphones makes it harder and harder for her to articulate the new sentence. Um, the dissociative effect of audio technology on a self-image in this work was noted by Patrick Langley, who considered voice dissemination as an instrument of political power. And in case of Nancy Holt's bewildering work, uh, contrasted uh, it. <clears throat> um, in case, um, yeah, uh, sensa bewildering sensations of being mobbed by her own echo on public television. She tells in, at one point in the video, I'm surrounded by me. Uh, a collection of contact sheets from Robert Rauschenberg Foundation archives documents the process of filming Brazos River. <clears throat> Four color cameras were operated by KERA TV studio staff, and Rauschenberg is portrayed actively supervising the course of action from a control room. Not particularly in this video uh, image, maybe on the left, but um, there are other pro uh, photos that capture him in action. So while working on Brazos River, he was able to act quickly on what he observed from the dancers and operators' movement. He believed that the artist has to be responsive and lucky, and the TV studio setting provided ideal conditions for perfecting his receptivity. Time spent in the control room was akin to Rauschenberg's process of making sill screens, where the pictures are not taken but combined and edited based on his extemporaneous reaction. As Anne Levy observed, Rauschenberg wanted to retain the inherent simplicity of the work and avoid any electronic gimmickry, which many video artists of this time experimented with. The necessity to make the piece continuously interesting for television audiences led to the use of a variety of camera angles and cropping. Operator Philip Makana helped Rauschenberg to arrive at the decision to film the dance from a variety of angles with detailed views of the dancers' bodies and long shots similar to how uh, football games were captured at that time. In an interview for Swank in the Arts Program, uh, which is at the collection uh, of SMU Library, and I will show a still from it later on, we also hear Rauschenberg suggesting shooting the dancers from the back to be seen from all around, which he says, will be a beautiful, might be a beautiful idea. Um, this brief note from Rauschenberg archive outlines the 10 days production schedule. Um, Mark Birnbaum, whom I interviewed early this year, was the technical director for this project and spent several days in the studio with Rauschenberg working on the post-production of the film, viewing cassettes and assisting with editing decisions. At the time when Birnbaum first met the artist um, in the studio on Captiva Island in May 1976, so probably goes back to this image, uh, he remembered that Rauschenberg was very interested in newspaper prints, but the video project for the Fort Worth Art Museum had no shape as of at that moment. Upon Rauschenberg's arrival in Dallas, <clears throat> Birnbaum was laying out the basic groundwork for what might be possible to achieve with the equipment available at KRA TV studio. A member of Viola Farber Dance Company and her husband at that time, Jeff Slayton, who we will later see in the video, uh, described this project in Farber's biography, The Prickly Rose. And I quote him here. For only one week, we went through hours and hours of tedious rehearsal and videotaping. Most of the time was spent waiting while the crew got the correct lightning and camera angles. By the time Dan Parr was happy with these, we felt like we were dancing our worst. Standing around caused our muscles to get cold and stiff. Each section of the dance was shot three different times with the dancers wearing a different color each shoot. In the final version of the video, the dancers changed colors in the middle of a single dance movement. The idea and the reality were amazing. Uh, Anne Levy's visionary proposal interested Patsy Swank, an arts reporter at KRA Channel 13, who produced an interview with Rauschenberg, Farber, and Tudor uh, for her television series Swank in the Arts that was broadcast at 7.30 p.m. on weeknights in that year in 1977. Um, in this film, uh, we hear how the reporter asked the artist about the obstacles of working in TV studio and the adjustments that he had to make. She asks, how do you adapt the finite medium of TV to this concept of freedom and search and change? Is it possible? What are the techniques you used? 
A member of the production team, <clears throat> Dan Parr, who's not captured on this screenshot, uh, talks how this project requires a lot more discipline and being attentive to time, which is always slipping away. <clears throat> As a painter, you can always go back to garage, he says, and do more. <clears throat> um, you cannot do that here. That's a big adjustment. <clears throat> In this video, we also hear the artists decide that Rauschenberg's role will be credited as visual presentation and costumes. Exactly in this moment, they define his role in the project. As well as moments of tensions and decision making in the backstage uh, are captured in the video. When Dan Parr, for example, asks dancers to follow the pass, and they respond, we don't know the pass. And they, it was followed by Viola Farber's, they don't have a path, they find a path and then follow. We are really walking. <clears throat> Speaking about her teaching style, Jeff Slayton noted uh, in his book, Viola allowed the dancers to feel that each was not only different physically from everyone else, but also different in every way. She didn't want them to hide the difference, but to bring it out in their dancing. It was not just how long they could balance or how high they could jump, but it was all the other things in their psychologic and emotional makeup that made each one's dancing unique. Uh, so to give us a better sense of the project, let's watch an excerpt from the video Brazos River now. Um, so the narrative of this video, 60 minutes long, um, 60, um, relies on the episodic nature of Viola Farber's choreography. Uh, Farber, who favored things unadorned and liked to tighten things up in her creations, initially proposed a series of short sequences, uh, 34 to be precise, for the score of Brazos River. Uh, such representation of dance in a television-based form resonates with Stanley Cavall's thesis about the maturity of a TV medium, its serial episode procedure of composition, and its admittance of discontinuities between the components of television programming. 
Even when interrupted in the middle, similar dance phrases developed by Farber reemerge in later parts of the performance, contributing to the feeling of familiarity with the overall program. At the same time, the truncated montage is not alienating for the viewer who would have been used to the feeling of being transported from a movie to a commercial or a weather forecast within relatively short period of periods of time on the TV screen. This collaboration might have influenced Farber's later productions. In a 1978 feature in New York Times magazine, she spoke about her upcoming program for the dance umbrella season at the Intermedia Theater, as, and she defined her dancing as choreographic reporting. In one work, for example, called Turf, um, which was danced to Poulenc's organ concerto, some tennis and basketball find way into the piece. The dance constituted a choreographic sports report since its pattern derived from sports movement that Farber watched on television one afternoon, according to her words. In Brazos River, Viola Farber's palette of movements, as Anne Levy described it, was intensified by what I call scalar volatility in the treatment of figures. Juxtaposing close-ups of bodies with the, the miniature representations of a full figure in the far end of the room, the film destabilizes space that could be imagined inside television in the process of watching the program. We will see some screenshots a little later as well um, to illustrate this point. At the beginning of the video, for example, uh, Viola Farber performs solo. Um, and we're looking at a slightly different shot of her, but imagine her dressed in a red leotard and her figure is centered on the screen while different camera angles modify the space around her. At first, she appears to be positioned close to the right back corner of the studio. In the following scene, the gray background of the floor recedes underneath the arched fill of darkness to accommodate the dance captured from the low angle. Later on, the camera focuses solely on Farber's feet and bent knees while her legs realign through a sequence of diamond-shaped movements. Finally, Farber rises above the floor in a leaping position, arms outstretched backwards, that the image I had on my cover on the first slide. Her full body is surrounded by the dark background as the camera continues to observe her from a low vantage point. Therefore, even within the constraints of a, originally a 21-inch screen of an old television, the effect that the body created was that of a flickering human figure expanding into the space and becoming minuscule the very next minute. Uh, for the museum installers and KRA TV studio technicians, the production of Brazos River remains memorable because of the amount of preparation that the space required. As Daryl Henke, carrier broadcast technician, recalls, this studio had been doubled in size just recently, and Brazos River became one of the first projects that they produced in the new space on Harry Hines Boulevard. These floor plans were sketched by Barry Whistler, then director of installations at Fort Worth Museum, who was overseeing the process of preparing KERA facilities for dancers. The concrete floor of the studio had to be covered with shock-absorbing layers of foam cushioning, linoleum, and plywood. The Dallas facility was nevertheless too small and its ceiling too low compared to Viola Farber's studio in New York. She decided to transpose KERA's TV's floor plan as a taped outline on the floor of her own space in New York to choreograph for the arranged performance site in Texas. As uh, seen in documentary photographs from the production days, um, the camera was often placed in the middle of the group of dancers, which allowed the operators to produce an illusion of an immersive spectacle for a viewer. They also alternated cameras from floor to ceiling positions, um, and the involvement of a beholder into the space of choreography at times was enabled by staging of a downward gaze when the horizon recedes to the very bottom of the image and feet and legs become a focal point in the frame, um, as we saw in the video and we see it now in the screen. In a sense, this video instantiates a postmodern approach to the picture plane that Leo Steinberg proposed in regards to Rauschenberg's work, where we encounter a paradigmatic shift away from the work of art as providing a simulation of a view through a window, implying this vertical stance on the part of the viewer, and in favor of a horizontal flatbed, 
implying a printing press-like horizontal surface. And Rauschenberg translated this successfully in the virtual space of television screens through such close-ups that generate a sense of the haptic. The embracement of possible vertical and horizontal registers um, of choreography is also evident halfway through the performance. Following Farber's dance with three partners, Willy Foyer, Andrew Peck, and Jeff Sladen, as we see them here, um, and her disappearance from view, the camera captures male dancers from above, laying on the floor with their feet close to each other as if defeated in a fight. The scene gets gradually blurred by way of superimposing a colored filter which bathes bodies in a foggy warm yellow, orange, and red light. In the second part of the video, the camera moves into a lower register as first accommodating the horizontally organized crawling, bending, and snake movements. And by the 38th minute, the effect of an almost round horizon is created via elevated camera view soft darkened corners of the room and the carefully blurred edges between the studio walls and the floor. Larry Clark in a green attire balances his body on the edge between spotlighted floor and darkened background appearing to be levitating into the abbey. Susan Murray's In Bright Signals addressed the power of synthetically generated imagery on television as it came to fruition after rigorous experiments conducted by the scientific, commercial, and regulatory communities in the 1950s. She said, fabric textures were set to pop, the reflection on bodies of water shimmered, and dancers in their costumes revealed a new level of subtlety and expressiveness in movement. The viewer felt transported, her senses stimulated on a multitude of levels. The sense of immersion arose from the way that the electronic color images were set to overwhelm the senses, refine and enhance vision, and expand horizons. Her summary of the rhetorical framing of color TV as a veritable, easily scalable tool for knowledge production across modern political landscape aligns with the triumph of abstract sublime in American painting post-World War II and during the Cold War era. In approaching this given terrain of idealized American consumer vision, Rauschenberg primarily addresses tension and anxiety associated with the emotional resonance and the volatility of technologically mediated colors at the same time. In Brazos River, Rauschenberg was challenged to calibrate the palette of a moving image in accordance with broadcast standards and drastically different receiving devices of the home, or, uh, home viewing audiences, including black and white TV models. As can be inferred from this enlarged screenshot, the video was made with an understanding that the transmission of color during the scanning process of a broadcast sometimes results in errors such as color trails, flicker, or after images. Anti-stability becomes a characteristic feature that overpowers the idea of a signal and scale in a televised electronic uh, color imagery. Oral effects around dancers, particularly those created by brightly colored leotards, and the degradation of outlines of moving bodies through bleeding, or it's also called ghosting, on a television screen, resembles penumbral margins of the images from solvent transfers in Rauschenberg's earlier Dante Inferno series that he worked on in the 50s. Since the 1930s, color standardization of the TV industry was rooted in psychophysics, the scientific study of the effects of stimulus on the perceptual system, which also incorporated into the design the human eye's capacity for failure. As Jonathan Stern and Dylan Mulvin argue in the history, of, uh, the history of Color TV proves the centrality of compression to the look of many 20th century visual media. Historically, for the experts in various TV color standardization committees who determined how to economize signal size during broadcast, compression went hand in hand with the parameter of fidelity or the idea of a good enough image in relation to spectrum economy and signal that would be provided to the viewers. The upgrades from black and white to color TV sets took place in the US, for example, throughout 1960s and 70s, and Walt Disney's Wonderful World of Color anthology series that ran on NBC in 1961 and 60, is through, from 1961 to 1969 is often described as an impetus for consumers to upgrade their devices. By the time Brothers River had been created, color television was becoming a dominant format 
but around a third of the household at the time would still have experienced this broadcast on black and white TV sets. The color palette for dancers' leotards was carefully considered by Rauschenberg after consultations with Kara TV specialists, after he discovered that only certain colors could be used on television due to tonal differentiations required for black and white transmissions. And then, based on the grayscale evaluator kit, he selected 40 colors out of the possible palette, and the decision was made to dye approximately 30 costumes accordingly. As a result, the leotards worn by the dancers seem to correspond with color bars on television test cards, an engineering guideline used to calibrate chrominance and luminance in TV monitors and receivers. The fathomless black background and gray floor were also electronically intensified in the video in order to let the costume colors stand out and, as Rauschenberg pointed himself, to give David Tudor, the, the composer who wrote the score for this video, maximum potential with sound waves. Um, here we see um, notes from curator Anne Levy who uh, basically reiterated uh, similar um, same issue that I just described about uh, importance of using specific colors or avoiding colors and basically her notes on how what is possible, what is not possible from technological standpoint. Um, Rauschenberg, for example, was also very interested in the possibility to get bodies um, disappear in front of a black uh, screen. Uh, he said, we were promised that it would happen, but um, those seemed like very nice things, uh, but ended up being not possible. This idea of disappearing without exiting from the room. It doesn't happen, but we don't care. So then we, uh, he started playing with uh, colors um, instead. Most importantly, Rauschenberg connected the bright color scheme of Brazos River to Jacopo Pontormo's paintings that he saw during his trip to Italy earlier that year. In a few moments, the movements of nine dancers compositionally echo, at least to me, the 11 figures in Pontormo's deposition from the cross fresco made in 1526-28, where Jesus and Mary are surrounded by angels in colorful robes and leotard resembling garments. It is possible, I think, that Rauschenberg read an essay by Leo Steinberg about Pontormo's decoration of Caponi Chapel published in 1974, because both of them, Steinberg and Rauschenberg, were very close at that time. Steinberg talks about the Renaissance artist's conception of the deposition altarpiece in the Florentine Chapel as a durational sequence. He claims that in deposition, Pontorma depicts the midpoint of the action, proving it by a careful analysis of movements articulated within figures. Steinberg detects the rotational effect of the altarpiece's composition by mapping the angles of separate parts of the angel's bodies. He focuses on the load-bearing androgynous figure at the front whose head foretells where the body will go and then reconstructs the sequence of his movements, possible sequence. First, the figure turns with the, his gaze and head, then it turns with the trunk, then his limbs turn. The principle of rotationality also applies to the body of Christ that is carried out of the frame, says Steinberg, towards the viewer. Steinberg pays close attention to the concept of scale in this artwork, noting the magnitude of Madonna's figure and concluding that the success of Pontormo's pictorial program for this chapel must have owed much to the compact scale of the chapel and to its openness on two sides. The common parameters between a Renaissance fresco and a moving image work produced for the television screen in the 70s are just basically movement and color. Rauschenberg intentionally referred to Pontormo's paintings when he talked about the colors of the leotards. But uh, it is likely that Pontormo's nuanced animation of bodies sparked his interest and informed his own sensibility regarding dance, particularly as he contemplated it in the Dallas television studio. Um, so let's watch another segment of the dance here.
So as you could hear from this clip, Brazos River also created an opportunity for an experimental sonic intervention by the composer David Tudor, who initially wanted to create a score elicited instantaneously from the electronic color signals of the video images. Um, the broadcast technician, Daryl Henke, that, who worked with the, the crew at that time, remembers that Tudor tried to use specially designed device, which he plays in front of a TV monitor in the studio, which detected brightness and um, color of the image. Organized on a grid, his optical pickup mechanism sends a specific area of the screen, providing input for the sound modulation. Tudor's idea was to pour off the uh, sound of the screen and cause no intrusion into the imagery. But in the end, however, the process of generating sounds from the changing luminance and colors of the dancers' outfits was too hard to control through the monitor, and Tudor ended up alternating the equipment manually. He had to wait until the videotaping stage to create the final complex audio score. Um, and SMU uh, Arts Libraries uh, just recently um, uh, we discovered this great, uh, fantastic footage of Tudor working with TV image and making sound, which reveals his creative process. Uh, in the video, he said that his hope was to have the TV image produce the sound, but it was rather difficult to achieve it. Um, and um, he also notes that it's not the TV is making the music, I am making the music, but the TV is providing me with material to make music. Um, Another, and here we have his um, diagram that he put together, uh, which goes back to another collaboration between him and Viola Farber um, called the Dinosaur Parts. He wrote music for that work as well. Um, I also wanted to briefly mention another unrealized contribution to this work. Um, in a text published at the Dallas Morning News on December 20th, 1976, Patty Moore mentioned that Alvin Luciers performed at the uh, adjacent studio at KRTV studio during production days. And initially this uh, score was also supposed to be included in Brazos River video, but um, they skipped it in the end. It involved operatic singing and visual imagery and was created with a Benson burner, a device for combining a flammable gas with controlled amounts of air before ignition. So this part still needs to be researched and it would be very interesting to lay the second uh, soundtrack on top of the video, I think. I would like to finish with a few notes regarding the title of the video. It was named after Rauschenberg saw a road, trip, uh, a road sign when driving. Brazos, as we know, is the longest river in Texas that runs within 50 miles of the city of Fort Worth and meets um, the Gulf of Mexico um, close to Port Arthur, Texas, where Rauschenberg was born. Some relatives on Viola Farber's father's side were also originally from Texas. The team considered shooting on air um, in Texas landscape, shooting this video, including Brazos River watershed, but it deemed impossible for technical reasons. In a letter to Rauschenberg from January 5, 1977, sent from the museum building still on the 1309 Montgomery Street in Fort Worth, and Levi says, uh, Robert, I'm sending the bottles of Brazos River water with the list of people who worked on the production. So it was just two weeks after they completed the work. Um, although there is no recorded evidence about the emotional connotation that the production team might have had in mind by referencing the name of the river, they were definitely all aware of the abundant folklore sources about Brazos River, its place in the Texan identity and the history of expansion of European civilization in the Americas, as well as the river's historical and archaeological connection to the cultures of indigenous people who live here. By the time the video was produced, this body of water was also poeticized in an acclaimed um, book published in 1960, Goodbye to a River, which depicts a three-week, 175-mile-long canoe trip that the author John Graves took down the Brazos River at the time when a series of dams was proposed along its water course. Within the control environment on the television monitors, Brazos River as a dance attempts to activate associations between flowing water and the dissemination of media, undermining the passive viewing position relegated by TV. Through the television screen, it reminds us how we as moving bodies emit and eventually dissolve into signals and how we experience the world through moving the body. 
In the coda of Brazos River, the dynamics of color interaction staged by Rauschenberg on the one hand and his ability to articulate the sensations of dancers' disembodiedness on the other underline the phantasmal nature of televisual imagery. The toss leotards in the final minutes provide a key to understanding an hour of dance on TV. Embracing the idea of cutoffs, Rauschenberg comes up with a meditative concluding act for this video, in which clothes are tossed on the floor for almost five minutes nonstop. This final scene opens with an entirely black screen, an orange leotard is thrown in the middle of the floor, and then every three seconds thereafter, one more leotard is added to the growing pile until the whole picture plane is covered with fabric. The image is composed of bright colors, pink, purple, yellow, peach, lavender, red, blue, and green are chaotically mixed, emphasizing the importance of movement and gesture over compositional logic. The pull of gravity, inertia, and weight of the fabric is highlighted in this unexpected ending of the dance, while the stunning colors enhance and intensify the beauty of one another. Um, Ra Rauschenberg interrogated textiles in his studio practice lots of time, and including um, the series produced shortly before Brazos River called The Jammers. Um, it, it also, in this context, it's relevant to remember about his early interview from Art News in 1958, where he uh, talks about a very depressing reproduction of Zurbaran painting that hung over his bed. Interested in the relation of a man to a sheet, Rauschenberg was captivated by the inhabited fabric, masterfully rendered against the inscrutable dark background in the painting of Zurbaran. The play of light on Saint uh, Serapion's robe entangles the viewer into a silent scene of his suffering, he told about it. It is hard to ascribe the qualities of a genuinely successful project to Brazos River, as there is practically no way to measure real feedback from the viewers at the time of the broadcast, neither on a technical level as far as reception, broadcast signal, image quality, nor from a conceptual point of view. Um, what formalist reflections outlined in my talk prove is the insistence on the scalar specificity of materials and the political specificity of scale in regards to the museum's interest in utilizing technology-based aesthetic and massive communication resource. As Maeve Connolly argued, the social space of television is difficult to stage within the gallery and museum environment. The veracity of television-based artworks is dependent upon the historical perception of scale, both by audience in the home and artists and engineers in the studios at the time of the work's creation. As such, televisual art is imbued with ideas of irretrievable embodied memory, relentless nostalgia, and the forever looming challenges of equipment obsolescence. The key point of entry into Brazos River deals with the effect of the video spilling out from its electronic format into the perceptual level and the place of visual broadcasting within the culture of mid-1970s, still dependent at that time on the ideas of modernity, technical progress, and consumerism. Television's imagined publicness promised amplified social impact to an art institution. To produce a work for television meant to establish contact with most likely new, spatially dispersed, and potentially much larger audiences. The museum's willingness to expand the range of responsibilities beyond the disciplines of painting and sculpture into performance, dance, and in this case, television broadcast, poses the question of the art institution's gradual displacement within a larger cultural infrastructure or not. Thank you so much, and thank you to all the people who were involved in this wonderful project and credited here.
Has it ever been shown in any of Rauschenberg's retrospectives? No, it was a true discovery for, um, I mean, it's noted in the history of his performance collaborations and dance collaborations, but as I mentioned, the last time it was screened outside of this 2019 screening at the Modern here, the last time it was screened uh, was 1978 at MoMA and Leo Castelli. And the question is, is how, yeah, what's the best way to screen it? Uh, for me, I'm really curious about uh, the small, the materiality of cathode ray tube television screen and how it translated the dance originally in the 70s versus the large scale projection. We see that this imagery translates really well in the larger screen, but uh, it's such an intriguing question to imagine how this dance would have been experienced by people inside homes. Have, have you seen it in black and white? No, <laughs> uh, but I want to, yeah. <laughs> did you, are you aware of the armory show Rauschenberg did with Bell Laboratories in the mid-70s in New York? Mm -hmm. you, you're aware of all that. And how he also had a tennis sequence in that as well. Oh yes, referencing sports, uh-huh. Yeah, with the sound effect in the tennis. Racket, the ball. I think it was also maybe Richard Serra who was one of the players. Yes, exactly. mm -hmm. Monsters, yeah. yeah, arts experience and technology. Mm -hmm. So it's preserved on film, like eight millimeter, uh, you know, the medium that it's getting preserved on? Or, or? So the museum here owns a DVD copy, and I particularly still am on a hunt for the original, the very original tape. Um, which must exist, but uh, I hadn't, I wasn't able to see it on my own yet. You, you mentioned uh, the Bunsen burner and Alvin was here. What was he, uh, Brian, what was his role to be initially, do you know? I know that this here was closely collaborating with Viola Farber for many years before they uh, were like all of the same group, and Viola uh, specifically wanted him to be included in this project. And as we saw from this early uh, images, they, they were discussing it back in 1976 uh, all together. But it's still not clear, um, at least it, it hasn't been um, discussed in the literature that I came across and archival documents why. Um, he stepped out at the very last stage because he obviously was in Dallas also for the shooting during those 10 days. Does the SMU School of Film and Video collection available to the public? Uh, they are starting to, it is available, yes, you can make research requests, particularly this collection of videos that were donated by KRA TV. Uh, station are now being digitized and I think they will soon be easily searchable uh, hopefully but right now it still takes some time to uh, find specific material depending on their request. Who did you, who did you work with there? Uh, I worked with uh, Beverly Mitchell who is the director of the Hammond Arts Library and they collaborate with the, the moving image curators um, and uh, Jolene Whose last name I'm afraid to pronounce? Julian de Vergas. Oh, I knew it. Well, thank you so much, Lyle, for being here tonight. Thank you all for joining us in person and anyone online too. Thank you. Thank you.